the presentation is a quick overview of the work that I do. I, here and, you know, every now and then I, I will jump inside academia and outside academia. Sometimes I will make full credit of it. Sometimes perhaps you will only find it on the, on the screen. Um, my kind of work uh, starts from, uh, let's say, uh, using computer and computational um, for computational design, and it starts in a slightly, I, I should say, more conventional way, as in looking at the actual uh, architectural space. Uh, here is a, a winning entry for a competition in uh, Arnhem, uh, developed with uh, with a London-based office called Cora, uh, in which we worked on a number of objects that uh, were scattered along the landscape, taking vaguely the shape of um, of a parachute and uh, animating the public, scape, public landscape of uh, this uh, new development in the, at the edge, in the edge of Arnhem. Um, the work here is, I primar primarily show it because uh, the, the work always tends to look at the computer from both ends, you know? from what you can see on the screen of the computer, but also from what you can see from where you are standing at the moment, that is the back of the computer, the range of cables, connections, networks that wire this machine into the physical space that's around us. This obviously is the stuff that you can do when you sit on my side of the computer, mostly, anyway. Um, the project was uh, fully developed. It was a, a glass-reinforced uh, cement, um, the material, and uh, in the end, these large shells, which were ranging from about, um, let's say, four meter tall, and very thin, about half a meter wide, all to the opposite, basically, ratio of dimensions, were all built out of 25 mil uh, um, shells, basically, which were actually, of course, supported by a steel frame which was sitting underneath. Grossmax was the landscape engineer that worked with us on the rest of the landscape. Other projects of that kind of engagement had to do with uh, 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 smaller pieces, in this case uh, uh, is a table for an exhibition design which um, was manufactured by a uh, quite interesting company uh, which is based in the UK called the Cordec, in which the entire piece was uh, uh, milled, CNC milled out of uh, polystyrene. This is about 2008. But, you know, for at some point my research also, I decided to take a slightly different direction, which is mostly what I'll be talking about today, and, uh, to, uh, and to try to problematize uh, statistic uh, information such as this one, no? that uh, the large amount of data that are produced uh, in the world have, are having an effect on not only the way we live, you know, pretty much all of you have a mobile phone and so on and so forth, you know all that, but also in the way in which the city is organized. Of course, you probably have heard of the large debate about the smart city, and you could say that the work tends to situate itself in that area of interest. Um, when you start analyzing large amount of data, of course, the computer is pretty much the only tool that you have available in order to interrogate the data in a way that it's first of all possible, but also through methodologies which are not available to just human uh, faculties. Um, and that is where the, the work is at the moment. And that's actually the work that we are developing at, um, you know, with the, of course at a small scale throughout the workshop. That is how to look at the city through data and how to use the computer as an interface between the physical space of the city, the virtual space of data, and of course us, you know, the designer of those conditions. Um, I also like the idea that most of the, of the computational or data that we have today no longer are uh, associated with uh, uh, computers. They are also distributed in, in reality or in materials as in the previous uh, uh, lecture was made very clear. Um, and one of the interesting, I think, critical points is to try to also challenge uh, images uh, like this one. Uh, this is a map of, uh, of the internet, which is, uh, of course, an incredibly fascinating uh, image, but um, somehow beside, let's say, the aesthetic allure that this image has, it's very difficult to interrogate for its meaning. You know, this uh, image really doesn't reveal much sense of agency, interaction, or ownership, which we know now are important elements when it comes to the virtual space of the internet. Um, 
because the physical space of the internet is also looking uh, much more like this. Uh, this is actually a photograph taken by Eflux, the quite good, uh, quite famous and good uh, art magazine of uh, in Tahir Square during the uh, uh, revolution in Egypt. Or at the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of scale, it also looks like uh, like this. That is the, uh, the the range of fiber optic cables that take our data throughout the world and, and actually form uh, the, the the internet. So, um, in, obviously, there is a kind of combination of technological, political, social, and cultural uh, elements that begin to form a, a strange condition, right? That um, we, could, we, could, we could identify our present uh, society with, at least in the West, mostly. Um, most of this work became uh, somehow clearer and more apparent to me by uh, looking at, at a more specific uh, physical event. Um, this is a piece of research that I started a long time ago, and I, I'm very happy to say it ended yesterday, and I'll explain in a moment what that means. Um, on the G8, uh, I looked at uh, 10 uh, G8 meetings um, between 1999 and 2010, so you could say 11, um, and as a, as a way of un to understand our digital physical space form or help us to understand the, our present condition. Um, it's very interesting. This is not a G8. I shall, I shall declare this first before um, someone else uh, picks that out. Um, but from 1999 till 2010, the G8 were, a very, were pretty much the center of global politics, you know, where the key event, one of the key events throughout the year where uh, the world was coming together um, uh, to discuss global agendas. And from 1999 all the way to 21 and uh, all the way to 2010, the G8 became an incredible, I think, uh, stage to understand how different issues were playing out in, in the public space. Um, this is actually where the actual meetings were held when um, uh, the Sea Island, the American G8, took place. Um, most interestingly, uh, there was a, a very sharp contrast between the physical transformation of the, of the space and uh, the proliferation from 2000, 2001 onward of the digital layer that was going to be overlaid into, in the cities. Um, I thought that uh, that was causing quite interesting questions in terms of how to represent and therefore understand and eventually intervene in uh, these places, and uh, that were, was forcing uh, a different way to represent it. So uh, part of the project was to abandon normal plans or sections on elevation or traditional diagrams and try to understand this space th only through scalar relationships. And when you understand it like that, of course, you have a, um, a quite different image of the public space, a quite, if you like, uh, almost uh, rough adjacencies of very advanced uh, technologies and very low-tech, almost, almost uh, brutal, if you like, interventions in the public space. Um, the also, there's a complex network of physical and digital actors and agents that um, come together to form this temporary city which only exists for three days and eventually vanishes. Um, which I, I was trying to map, again, through relationships of scale and agency. There's also physical reality to these places, which uh, get temporarily reconfigured, and there's a, even a highly immaterial uh, element of these spaces, which is here represented by the color tagging uh, that is attributed to any participant to um, a G8, or at least in the time period I looked at. Um, so this is, of course, the most immaterial element, which is law. Beside the, G the G8, uh, one of the other reasons why this research on a, a kind of smart city, you could say, um, was interesting to me, was that more and more uh, other situations, this is uh, London uh, in preparation to the Olympic Games, we were looking at this complex mix of different technologies and different uh, attitudes towards public space that were being unfolded. 
Um, this is actually very close to where I live. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, uh, I'm happy because last night uh, this book was launched and the book contains uh, a quite extensive uh, uh, paper, if you like, on, on, on this, uh, this long-term research on the nature of, of uh, the G8 public spaces. Um, a second project I want to talk about is a, is a slightly different one. And it's a project that was commissioned by the city of Chamen in uh, China. It was done in collaboration with uh, uh, Cora, the same office that I uh, mentioned before. And uh, the, the, master, the idea is basically to create a, a master plan for the city. Um, the, uh, one of the concepts that we wanted to develop was, uh, as, uh, first of all, to, to design a master plan around the issue of energy as a driver. And, uh, of course, the second thing that we had to deal with was the kind of rapid demographic growth that the city of Chamen was uh, planning. And the third and final element was that the, there was no official comprehensive city-wide uh, planning document for the city. Uh, we made a proposal, and which was basically that the city could have skipped to have a traditional master plan for the city and adopt uh, digital technologies as a way to uh, create its own master plan. We gradually, we propose to make a kind of demonstration piece first, which is what you're looking at here. The, the, you know, the, the, the center piece is a four meter by four meter model, which um, represent the entire metropolitan area and uh, is informed by um, cybernetic principles of uh, uh, feedback, which were mostly uh, influenced by the work of uh, Stafford Beer, the British uh, cybernetician that also worked on planning, um, in which the citizens were able to interact with the, with the model, see uh, uh, energy patterns of distribution and, con and consumption, and somehow uh, engage with, with an energy-based uh, master plan. Um, the, the, uh, the, the actual piece is eventually divided into tiles, which are uh, about 300 millimeters square. And uh, uh, underneath this tile, a, a, a grid of LED lights, uh, which are interactively controlled, determines the degree of luminosity of, uh, of, the, of the light itself. Um, there was a kind of a computational model, which we internally developed in order to gauge a number of uh, parameters that had to be working together. And eventually we uh, decided to uh, manufacture the tiles uh, by rapid prototyping them, and therefore having a very thin, about uh, actually a millimeter thick edge uh, to the model, which um, provides us with, uh, I suppose, a number of advantages. Not only practical advantages, of course, because we had lights underneath, but also um, created a, a complete uniformity between man-made and natural. So the city was actually made of one element, uh, no distinction. Uh, and the second thing was actually that uh, it created a quite uh, delicate uh, landscape, almost like a, a, a veil, if you like, that was floating above the city. Uh, perhaps uh, that sort of more, if you like, emotional or experiential way of associating with the model was also useful to suggest that the city is still a delicate organism that um, needs uh, a certain amount of curation. Underneath this uh, thin and quite poetic level, there was actually a, a, a jungle of uh, cables and lights and circuits uh, eventually wired into Arduino circuit boards, eventually wired inside uh, computers, which was controlling this complex system of lights. Um, the final result is, of course, uh, one in which the, um, the, the model changes quite rad radically. It's, it's a look when, uh, when the lights are activated, and the, um, the pattern of consumptions can be, uh, of, of energy consumptions, are, 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 are visualized. Um, 
There are a number of variables which have to do with the kind of energy or the kind of, uh, the, the kind of uh, source of energy that affect the color of the light. There are other things that we could manage with the computational model having to do with the kind of effect of that light, meaning the closer the LED light to the skin, the more kind of point like you get, and of course the opposite if you lower the actual uh, LED light. And uh, um, the, the, the model was eventually uh, wired inside the computer and, um, and, and therefore both uh, real data and other data that we were actually adding to the model to also show how things could have been uh, adapted were, uh, were visualized. The, the citizen interaction in this case wasn't so much to design the city but literally to understand the, their own environment through pure and flows of energies. Um, Another project I worked on subsequently, uh, this uh, master plan um, for Xiamen, was actually uh, a project that uh, was uh, developed for an art competition in the, in the United States. And one of the things that was really interesting in the work in Xiamen, which we couldn't quite achieve, at least through the kind of short time frame we had at our disposal, was that eventually the possibility, not, not unlikely the work that in the 50s and 60s people like Buckminster Fuller or Stafford Beer were doing, eventually computation could have been a, a, a tool to wire the behavior of a city inside very large global forces that uh, are otherwise very difficult to visualize. Now, there's always one example that I use, which is that uh, open air mine in Australia have a, a, a computational model that is directly wired into the price of gold and the fluctuation of price of gold. And that fluctuation affects the speed at which the actual mine uh, proceeds in, in excavating into the ground. So, and this incredible disjunction of scales and also of material and immaterial flows is often something that is, uh, has to do, of course, with living in a global world, but also very hard to grasp otherwise. So in this project, um, the, the idea of sight unseen, what, what should we visualize, visualize of a sight that we can't see otherwise, um, was working along those lines. And um, there was, a, I suppose, a, a kind of coincidence that uh, this place was uh, in Tennessee, exactly on the 35th parallel of the Earth. And um, that was the datum, that was the starting point of the project. And 21 major cities that also shared the same geographical position were mapped along this ring, which eventually was also animated by uh, data about these places. The data are distributed in a kind of material immaterial, uh, along a material immaterial gradient. You know? So the, the inner circle have to do with things that are highly tangible, like access to fresh water or uh, level of uh, um, natality, uh, all the way to um, the opposite end where the more immaterial elements such as internet connection and so on and so forth are uh, mapped. What we are looking at is of course a computer model, but uh, is the uh, simulation of the final piece, which uh, was a piece to be experienced through augmented uh, reality. So the uh, final element is a, is a 35, uh, meter wide ring with all these different data which are tagged and therefore are accessible through your mobile phone. The source for the work is, um, is the quite famous uh, CIA factbook which is uh, a, an excellent actual uh, up-to-date atlas of the world and um, there's a series of uh, kind of relatively simple computational tools that are used to orchestrate the fluctuation of the data on the database with the um, actual the augmented reality piece. So in the end, the piece has, a, a, again, uh, not unlike uh, previous examples, um, has the ambition of working both, both as an analytical tool, but also as a more kind of experiential, almost like a, an installation uh, uh, in a public space. Uh, this is a brief text of how 
the piece work. The piece, I, I, I must say, this is also a couple of years ago, had to be, you know, the polygonal count has to be kept within a certain limit in order for average uh, mobile phones of the time to be able to compute um, the model um, with, with enough uh, kind of reaction, uh, quick time reaction. Um, I also generated other uh, visualizations of the project which try to forget about this limit, polygonal count limit and almost create this sort of shower of uh, data uh, that could also be seen as varying over time and, uh, and so on and so forth. Again, these are all elements that uh, are accessible through the, to the database. So the database, both as, a, as Lev Manovich says, the database both as an analytical tool but also as a symbolic uh, form for, uh, in, in, for our present culture. A um, few more projects, uh, quite small, but uh, I still think quite interesting. This one was developed with um, Italian architect uh, Guido Incerti, uh, and it is a, f uh, a study commissioned by Nestlé uh, to, for the future of retail. Uh, this was uh, also commissioned in 2011, uh, in which, again, uh, we started looking at the presence of what we ended up calling art systems and uh, light systems inside the retail and um, the retail area and proposed uh, uh, three future scenarios for uh, the, the brand or at least three ways in which the brand could have engaged these emerging technologies at the time which are here listed uh, is, uh, as a store beyond the store network condition and uh, Immer em experiencing slash immersing in data. Um, the, the, schema the schematic um, sort of approach, this was just a kind of initial study, uh, was one in, the, in which, of course, the use of screens could have expanded the, the role of uh, the retail space outside the physical limits of the retail space, but still operating within the, the city. And uh, as said before, could have used the intelligence of, uh, of um, databases as often experienced when we browsed for something in, on Amazon to create a network of uh, related products. You know, of course, Nestle, uh, as you know, because the expo is about to open, Nestle uh, operates in the field of uh, uh, food production. And um, it's Again, it's quite interesting to relate uh, the world of data to the kind of hard reality of food, how it's manufactured, how it's produced, how it's shipped, what kind of elements are uh, interfering or uh, helping the, the supply chain that moves basically a raw product from somewhere to uh, a shelf in your supermarket. Or finally, um, the use again of augmented reality to um, enhance the, uh, the retail experience in the, in the, in the actual shops. Um, this year, I, I have been working with uh, this company called Big Art Mob, also based uh, in London. These are research projects that mostly take place uh, through uh, the Royal College of Art, where I teach, uh, where I've been teaching for the past nine years. And uh, Big Art Mob uh, is a company that was launched uh, a while ago by an initiative led by Channel 4 to map, um, to map um, public art in, in London initially. Um, it runs uh, a, no a normal basically database of public art which has now expanded well beyond London and runs on a, on a quite traditional platform that is on, on Google Earth as an additional layer. The, the uh, research question we developed together was to explore what kind of limit in terms of scale was possible for the company to, uh, uh, to map. And uh, uh, of course, uh, being an architect, uh, we d we, the focus was very much in trying to uh, integrate buildings inside the, um, the database itself. Of course, uh, the relationship between build, the build, how buildings are archived uh, runs along the actual, you know, three-dimensional, if you like, constructions has a lot to do with software and the CAD packages we have uh, at hand to model uh, buildings. Um, we wanted to challenge that. We devised a case study, which was basically where we run all our tests on, 
on uh, this um, experiment in which um, we started using a slightly different uh, platforms uh, like this one the pro uh, which Autodesk developed called 123D Catch in which um, with a relatively simple set of photographs of an object, a three-dimensional uh, mesh is reconstructed for you. Um, the, um, the, we had some issues with the, that we had to overtake, uh, or overcome, sorry. Um, one was that um, the, uh, of course, Autodesk uh, run is as a proprietary software, is a pr one to three catch is a proprietary software, and therefore somehow we wanted to have a more open, at least in terms of accessibility, um, uh, approach to the problem. And also, this, uh, the, uh, you don't really have any uh, control through in the way in which the uh, process takes place. You upload the photographs and you get something back, and that's it. So we started uh, to test uh, a, a number of different options, and eventually, uh, and also, you know, the possibilities for actually manufacturing uh, buildings or scans of buildings uh, directly through uh, rapid prototyping. And uh, eventually, uh, we um, found a, a different kind of software, which I'll, I will describe in a second, uh, which is an open source, uh, an, uh, an open software, an open source software uh, called uh, Visual SFM, which uh, some of the students are also playing with uh, these days. It, which allows us allowed us not only to control the project the process itself but actually to open it up much more and that is a quite interesting element that um, emerges when you work in this area that uh, somehow the the construction of the tools to achieve a certain result can be as important as the result that you want to get so trying to understand the kind of uh, initial position and try to lower the entry point uh, both in terms of uh, technical difficulties, but also in terms of uh, sort of social engagement, if you like, uh, was was interesting. The software, like I said, is is, is quite simple and allows you to generate uh, three-dimensional point clouds of uh, of your building, which you can eventually, um, of course, translate into meshes and there and give it a more uh, a look that is, let's say, uh, closer to the actual architecture that you are um, trying to map. Um, there's quite a lot of interesting work in terms of the granularity or, or of, the, um, of the scans themselves, or perhaps this is the part that I like the most, uh, in the stuff that happens behind the actual interface of, of the software in terms of correlation of elements and uh, the uh, the, uh, and the actual output that um, is, is generated, which is again a, a database, uh, in, this, in this case uh, 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 in form of an Excel sheet, in which a number of parameters are, are um, listed. Um, through that we started uh, a number of experiments on the, the visualization of uh, this information, the, how it could have been made accessible to a large public, and uh, um, also, uh, we started also to test it on other elements, in this case uh, uh, with uh, students as well, starting to really understand how um, data or architecture can be seen by an artificial eye, and uh, it's starting to generate visualizations in which the actual database, the actual number, the numbers are interrogated in, in a slightly different way. So playing colors versus geometry or trying to find shape uh, detection or elements within the facade and, and foregrounding it in order to really uh, represent uh, architecture uh, in a different way, in a way which is otherwise relatively complex uh, to the, the human eye. From this uh, sort of point clouds and spatialized reconstruction, we also went into more analytical uh, stats in which the color distribution are analyzed and uh, this is very much work that um, I'm still um, uh, pushing for. And, um, and even if this sort of um, short um, research project with, uh, with this company uh, has now been brought uh, to, has now been finished, we've concluded it. Um, the very final project I want to talk about is, uh, is also about uh, 
this kind of uh, large data sets and their role in the city. It's a project that uh, uh, I'm, I never really talked about, but, but uh, because one is recent and B is also uh, a project that uh, we, we are, I suppose, still working on in a certain way. Uh, it was done with, uh, with uh, Antonella and uh, with uh, a musician and software designer, Martino Traversa, and uh, Raffaele Pe, which I'm very happy to see also in the audience today, um, in which um, there, it was a proposal for the city of Bristol, which was titled Bristol Madrigals, and it was an a, idea to create five kind of stations uh, throughout the city in which uh, sound could have been used to enhance, augment the, the, uh, the uh, experience of the city. Uh, the technology behind it is a technology called uh, Ambisonic, uh, which allows, which has been developed about 30 years ago, I understand, and allows you to position a, a sound in space. Of course, a more commercial version of this technology is found in pretty much any uh, headphone set that you can buy. And uh, we found really interesting the idea of treating sound as a proper material, in a way, it, it, with the same characteristic, if not more characteristics, of the kind of materials that architects are uh, accustomed to. So um, our role in the project was actually to begin to understand how to visualize this uh, three-dimensional uh, set of sounds, which has a dynamic va component, and also as a, as a material itself. So we developed at first initial some kind of interfaces, and uh, this is not our work. We also looked at the actual uh, technology behind uh, the, the position of the speakers in space, the digital interface that links the physical space of the recording studio, in that case, with the um, uh, uh, software space in which uh, the, the, the project can be simulated and orchestrated. And uh, eventually, uh, these are sort of uh, initial studies, we started developing a series of point clouds, again, in which the, um, the information from the music played through these uh, systems and, they, and its uh, exact position in space could have been linked to a digital model that um, could visualize the, um, the architecture of sound, basically. Um, and eventually, we, uh, we proposed to use, again, augmented reality as the interface between, actually, the user and, uh, and, the, and the space of, uh, of the city. Um, so it's a quick overview, but you know, I, th I suppose it gives you a rough flavor of the things I, I do when I'm not, I'm not here. Um, thank you very much.